Uh, this is the uh, sixth uh, lecture of a lecture series on the Moscow Pullman uh, aquifer system. Uh, this was on recharge. Uh, the previous five lectures were on sort of the basics of Columbia River basalt hydrology and on the fundamental information that we have on the Moscow Pullman area and on the, the larger uh, Palouse Basin. So some people may be picking up the talk at this point because these are the interesting parts if they have a previous background. Uh, this lecture is on recharge. The next one, next one is on what we know about the upper aquifer, which we have it pretty well defined. And then the one after that is on a conceptual model of the lower aquifer. So these three talks uh, uh, are now getting down to let's get to the guts of what's going on with our aquifer system. And it might go a little faster because uh, I uh, assume now that most people have a little bit of a handle or at least a base idea on their uh, on what's going on, what, what are the basics and we can build up uh, from there. This particular view right here, this particular view is standing on a quartzite outcrop on Kamiak view and looking east into the Southern uh, Palouse range. Uh, and there's three sort of mini geographic features here that are important to understanding our aquifer system. Uh, from standing across the Luss Fields, uh, which is you're all familiar with, or driving around, this is in the central part of the uh, Moscow uh, Pullman Basin, one of the largest areas in the Palouse Basin. So underneath this is where our aquifer system is at. Uh, very few outcrops, as we mentioned before. The basalt uh, of part of the aquifer system ends about in the subsurface, ends about where my cursor is now. You see sort of a change in slope. So we, uh, at that point in the subsurface, the basalts have already uh, pinched out and we start across what we call uh, what I call the slopes of Moscow Mountain area. And it's a pretty large area, and it's pretty narrow. It's farmed. Uh, this particular area has now become very important because uh, uh, several people, particularly students under uh, Brooks from the Soil Department University of Idaho, have identified and uh, documented research along that slope area. Uh, so there's recharge getting into uh, the subsurface in that point. Part of the problem of uh, not quite understanding this area was in part created by me and decades of misunderstanding. We know that the mountain area, the treed area, is all underlain by uh, hard granitic rock and that has a thin soil of uh, and in some places a thick soil of weathered granitic uh, material. But out in this area, we also believed out in this slope area, up until a few years ago, uh, believed that the granite bedrock was pretty much came to this near to the surface. The reason we believed that is the cuttings that you see from the drill hole. When you drill through a granite, that's partially what, particularly when it's weathered. What you see coming out of your well is quartz, uh, muscovite, and clay. The other grains of the granite grind up into finer material. And the, your first impulse was, is the fact that it's granite. Uh, it turns out that there's lots of sediments in here. George Grader turned thinking on this uh, back about 2010. This area is underlain not only by granite that sometimes near the surface, but at other times there's three to four to 500 feet of sediments that when you look at the cuttings coming up, they're quartz and clay and muscovite, and they've been recorded as a granite. So I uh, can't blame this on the drillers. This was also what most professionals thought. But we have hard rock granites on the mountains. We have Moscow slopes in which, uh, you have both sediments and granites, and then we get out into uh, where the basalts are flat underneath and get into our aquifer system. 
this little bump over here is another research, uh, no, a piece of quartzite sticking out. The key to part of why, uh, where our recharge is coming from on these high elevations, high snow melt, uh, wells on the slope area have a, a water level that in the springtime is above that down in Moscow and Pullman, somewhere 2,700 feet, 2,600 feet, 2,900 feet. So this is where I'm going to talk about our recharge coming from. Now, I would sidetrack just a hair to remind you that this goes against what some people still believe. In the 2000s, we developed a MADRA that uh, there wasn't recharge in this area. There wasn't much recharge coming off the mountain that was getting into the surface, and that all of our water out here coming from our aquifer system was old, what we call Pleistocene water. The new research, uh, primarily sponsored by PBAC in the last uh, 15 years, to show that that's not correct. We do have a lot of modern recharge. Recharge is significant. Uh, uh, and water we're drinking, a lot of it is modern water. Uh, it doesn't mean that our system is now saved. We still have water decline each year and have to be concerned, but we need to change our thinking into a more, uh, more modern type of way to think about our basin. And one, it's an active system. Uh, it's not a dead system and it has modern recharge. We'll start off by just making a comment about, since there we go, making a comment about the upper aquifer recharge. The next lecture, we'll talk in detail about that aquifer. And we'll talk about the age of the groundwater. And we'll talk about recharge from Moscow Mountain. And then we'll talk about other recharge areas. And then we'll sort of draw those together in concluding statements. So we'll just look at another diagram. I don't know if we've used this before or not, but this is a diagram, a cross section from um, oh, halfway between Moscow and Poland about the uh, Toyota uh, dealership. And it's turned more to the Northeast. The other cross sections we've used uh, head eastward into Moscow. So this one's turned, it goes through the Northern part of the city of Moscow and heads up towards the mountain fronts. And it just gives us a little different view you have to sometimes think in three dimensions. If you look at the Moscow cross-section, it's right through the dead center of town. It will show you that the low, low flow gets awful close to the basement rocks. And the same with some of the underlying Grand Run flows here in red. When you turn it to the Northeast and get up, to, and as you continually turn it towards Moscow mountain area, you will find that there's a larger area of sediments, larger area where the low, low flow did not make it all the way to the mountain fronts. Uh, now, the upper aquifer, we brief, briefly described it before, consists of the sediments of Bowville, the basalt of Lolo, and the thick vantage member in Moscow. In Moscow is the only place we have large production wells that come out of the upper aquifer. That water comes primarily from the Vantage member. When I say major production, uh, 500 gallons a minute, 1,000 gallons a minute, uh, up to 1,400 gallons a minute capabilities. The reason I'm taking time to point about this on recharge is that this aquifer has been documented since the 1920s to recharge on an annual basis, uh, irregardless of what some of the chemistry data uh, age date data might suggest the data is 100 years long. You, when you cut the wells off, you recharge at about a rate of two to three feet per year. It is true that we over it in the 1950s, and that led to the modra that, that we dried it up. It is not dried up. It recharges, and if it's documented, uh, there's no need to point it out. I can say at least three times, four times off the top of my head, it's been documented that it recharges it two to three feet per year. And it's modern water. Uh, it has a uh, sort of a renewable uh, capacity of about 400 to 500 million gallons per year. Uh, it does have the iron content and therefore 
Uh, we've used it as little as possible, but it is a renewable resource. And more importantly, it documents that in the upper aquifer, we have a modern recharge on a yearly basis. It's not old water. And we will talk about some of the evidence then that we have that that's going to occur down here and we start getting into the low aquifer. So we'll use that as a jumping stone, so the point, jumping point to prove that, indicate, give this, present the data, excuse me, present the data on why we have water recharge into the lower aquifer. So let's, uh, we'll talk about this age of the groundwater a bit. This is a question that comes up constantly. The last time I uh, attended the uh, uh, symposium held every year on the, uh, on the aquifer system, uh, supported by primarily by uh, uh, PBAC and some other entities, the question that came up was how old is the water? So that question, that was in 2016, I think, spurred me to start thinking about the carbon-14 dates. And let's look at the history a little bit. Uh, in the 2000s, uh, a lot of carbon-14 dating was done throughout uh, the Palouse Basin. These dates came up as uh, 28,000 so, uh, in Palouse City area, 20,000 plus in Moscow, 14,000 plus uh, in Pullman, uh, so the consensus was, and a lot of that data was summarized and presented by, uh, published with Dal uh, Douglas in 2007. Those dates corresponded to earlier work, 30 years, 30 years, 40 years earlier, uh, uh, done by Crosby and Chambers. Again, the, the indication was, and people began to believe that all of our water is old out of the lower aquifer, and it's called, they call it Pleistocene water. Shortly after that, more data started pouring in. About the same time in 2007, uh, the budget for research from the various entities into PBAC was increased and a lot of research precipitated from that, from that, from those dollars. First thing that was covered was there were three master theses done on large pump, there were large pump test theses uh, there had been previous large pump tests, but these three, one by uh, Flo Nagy, uh, one by Fiedler, uh, one by Moran, every one of those came to the conclusion that there was significant recharge. Now, they did not have enough data to indicate uh, a precise number, which is what everybody wants to have. Everyone, how much is our recharge? Well, uh, Moran did suggest that, uh, that the significant recharge was slightly lower or just a little bit lower than what we pump out. And we generally, you know, for an average, uh, we're pumping out uh, 2.3 uh, million gallons a year. Uh, so therefore you can make your own assumption what the word lower means, but somewhere between 1.5 and uh, 2 million gallons a year is recharge water. Uh, those theses were very good reports. Uh, I'd like to jump ahead a little bit. I'm going to come back to later and talk about some re other research sponsored by uh, uh, a PBAC at, at, in 2011 by Moxley. But let me jump ahead a little bit to uh, Pearshaw and Sprinky. Uh, 2015, they approached the issue of research, uh, the issue of recharge from a different angle. They uh, studied uh, the rise and fall of water levels during major earthquakes and took that data to calculate porosity, permeability, and so forth. And they uh, identified that recharge area, there was a recharge area in Pullman. This made sense geologically, as we've talked about before, uh, the basalts in Pullman, beneath Pullman, fold down a little bit as you drive down into Pullman and you get down into the lower elevations, 
that uh, con that the, that area is near the contact of the and is actually in the contact between the bottom of the overlying low low flow the sediments, uh, the vantage sediments are maybe 30, 40 feet down and very close to the top of the Grand Ron. In fact, the Grand Ron is exposed in Western uh, Pullman. So it, the water, the streams are going across an intraflow zone. So recharge is very likely there. Uh, they also uh, suggested that using their calculations, they, uh, suggested that uh, the recharge water were actually uh, make up about 60% of our annual one foot decline. So what you can interpret for that, what they were saying was, is if um, the water we're drinking, if a larger portion of it is recharge water, then the conclusion is there is significant recharge. Uh, not insignificant. The water level is still dropping one foot per year, but the water we're drinking is modern. A lot of the water we're drinking is, in fact, modern recharge uh, water. Uh, backing up a little bit during the during sort of some of the same research, a grader uh, with his own resources, I think, uh, I don't know where he had his got his resources from, but he did a lot of work on looking at wells, uh, pits, uh, outcrops up on what we what I call the Mos slopes of Moscow Mountain. In fact, in some cases, he went up into the treed area and looked at the uh, exposures in that area. What he pointed out was, he pointed out, he was the first to point out that some of the earlier mapping by myself and some of my students uh, had shown the area to be uh, underlain by granite with very few sediments on top. And we also, he noticed that where we ended, the sediments of Bowlville, as you approach the mountain fronts, was way short. He's, he was very nicely worded that, uh, that he agreed with Bush they were just a mile and a half off on their contact. Well, once you look at his data, you realize he was actually being nice to us. Uh, he identified sediments a lot closer to the mountain front than we mapped because we had followed the old Madra that all the drill holes said granite, so therefore it must be granite. And he was the first to point out that those slope areas are not all granite, they're underlined by a lot of sediments. He worked closely with uh, Aaron Brooks out of the soils department. Brooks had uh, uh, four students uh, that came over from the Netherlands, supported, uh, they had their own support, except that they got to the, Got to uh, Moscow, uh, PBAC supported their research. And uh, those students uh, looking at soil first, just trying to study soils and recharge into those soil areas, they discovered up on the mountain, up on the Moscow mountain slopes, that there was identifiable and documental research, uh, recharge. And some of their estimates uh, are up to four inches a year on those slopes. Uh, they also traced using their quantitative uh, data, they traced uh, uh, some of the water, modern water into the uh, uh, Moscow area uh, and gener suggested that uh, that uh, water in Moscow was in fact uh, being recharged from the mountain fronts. Shortly after their reports, uh, Cal Duckett, a student at the University of Idaho, sponsored by PBAC, and his advisor, Jeff Langman, they came out with a major paper, a major paper of my point of view, in that they had uh, quantitatively documented the fact that snowmelt water from the Moscow Mountain area could be detected in Moscow. Moscow and could be detected over in Pullman. So the conclusion was the water is moving from the Moscow mountain area towards the outlet of our subsurface over in Pullman. Um, most more importantly than that, they detected the presence of uh, 
carbon, dead carbon uh, in our systems. And uh, that calculated with, from, that de from the amount of dead carbon that they detected, uh, calculated that the uh, dates that we have for the carbon-14 are much, old, much too old. And they also deducted that you, if you read through that, you have to have modern recharge, some modern recharge uh, in order to explain the data that they collected. That article is a very significant article. And I hear even recently, maybe I shouldn't be saying this on this lecture because it's not verified yet, but uh, uh, other entities around the country, Woods Hole being one of them, is interested in uh, the area because they got interested from Duckett and Langman's work. So how did we go wrong? We, we went, this module we had for several years was that the water was old. So how did those carbon-14 dates, why were they in air? Uh, after the question I had that they at the, was raised at one of the um, fall uh, Palouse Basin aquifer presentations uh, about groundwater dates, I started reading as much as I could for a while into carbon-14 dating. I'm not an analytical person, so I found it difficult to plow through some of it. The first thing I found out, and what was most interesting to me, is that uh, carbon-14, of course, is used for every kind of dating, all kinds of things. But it was very clear that dating groundwater using carbon-14 methods is very difficult. And some words, almost, some people use the word tricky. Uh, a couple of the reasons given was that uh, if your aquifer system is compartmentalized, it can give you older dates. Well, the Moscow aquifer system, both the upper aquifer and the lower aquifer are very compartmentalized. Um, uh, this has been proven by the long-term pump test data we had. It's been proven by the geology is complex, the hydrology is complex, Pump test data shows that uh, the uh, lower aquifer, even though water levels are interconnected, the resources are very compartmentalized. So we're very compartmentalized aquifer. So possibly that's the reason that uh, the dates we have, we were, in other words, you're pulling old water out from, in, out from pockets to get that out and that confuses your dates. Another reason they gave is that if you have the presence of wood, in your aquifer system, that that will give you old dates. Uh, the aquifer system in the Moscow Pullman area is full of wood. Uh, you can look, you can um, dig in some of the road cuts occasionally in, in Moscow or ditch cuts. I've pulled wood out of those uh, sediments of uh, Bowville on the top of our sequence several times. You can look at well data, the drillers sometimes tend to miss the wood. They drill right through it. Water may turn black for a, for a few minutes, but they're more interested in when they're drilling through the sediments, they're more interested in maintaining their drill because it's actually uh, more difficult to maintain the drill that in soft material than it is in hard. Uh, you look at the well data though, you'll see some of the drillers noted the uh, noted wood. I one time, was a novelist driller on one well, and I drilled through a, uh, a log for uh, two feet. Uh, Mos uh, WSU number seven, which is 2,250 feet deep, our deepest well, right at the bottom, you look at the report from the drillers, uh, from the material written up from those chips, and I seen that myself because I uh, helped construct those lithology logs from the samples they collected, there's pieces of wood right at the bottom of that well, 2,000 feet down. So there's wood throughout the whole system. Uh, it's not petrified wood. It's wood that you can take home and dry it, and stick it in your fireplace and burn it. Uh, drillers pointed that out to me five decades ago because the one driller helper I knew he would collect throughout the year, he would collect all the small pieces of wood that came up 
and were in, in, in the cuttings. And he put them in a bag because they were sort of impure in the fact that they contained quartz and uh, some clay. And he'd throw those in the fireplace at Christmas time. And the well, the, the fire coming off of those would sparkle because when it hit those uh, minerals, it would be blue and uh, green and reds. And so he uh, burnt that wood on uh, Christmas Eve. Interesting. I should have listened to the drillers back then. They may have known more than they certainly probably knew a lot more than I knew. Now, when you uh, look at uh, Reed, Duckett, and Langwin, they uh, think the excess carbon is coming from uh, emanations from a lower magnetic, uh, excuse me, magmatic zones, and it's rising into the water system. And so that's the source of the dead carbon. Well, it doesn't matter whether they're right or I'm right. Point is, there's dead carbon in there. So what that led to, if you go back to how carbon-14 dates are calculated, the analytical procedures are very, need to be very precise and the water data needs to be collected very carefully. And I believe they've done that in other research, including way back when Crosby did it. Uh, I think their analytical techniques were fine. But when you look at how the model is calculated, at some point you have to decide what kind of an aquifer you're in. The module at the time was that our aquifer system was a basalt aquifer system. Well, it's not a, uh, just a basalt aquifer system. It's a basalt sediment system. In fact, the sediments may be more important than the basalts. So there's a point in that model calculation where you have to decide which way to go, a non-carbon hydrology system or one that has a lot of carbon in it. Well, in the calculations done in the past, they chose to go the route of uh, no carbon, a basalt system. And I think that's the primary reason those dates are, are in error and are misleading. So let's uh, change here and give me a second to get my photographs up where I can see what's coming. So the question comes up is how do we get, if there is recharge, how do we get that water from the mountain front down into our system? Um, I should point out too that there's uh, information or data well collected that shows us uh, in where they studied that the, so much clay in against the low, low flow that they doubt recharge is coming down and moving into the basalt flows. So the question is, how do we get that water from the mountain fronts into our lower and our upper aquifer system? So to explore that a little bit, I've taken a photograph here of a, the Catalina Mountains in uh, near uh, Tucson, Arizona. And it's a good picture illustrating the elevation differences of what it was like in the Palouse Basin before the, the salt flows started entering over Pullman. This, I'm standing about 3,000 feet in elevation. A few miles away is 6,000 feet of steep relief up to the top of the mountain area. There's even a ski area up there, believe it or not, here in Arizona. <coughs> the rocks are all granite, just like the Moscow mountain area. But I think it illustrates to us how steep the mountain front can be. So if you're standing here with my camera and a basalt flow is moving towards me that I don't see, it's going to end somewhere before it gets to the mountain front if we use the Moscow Pullman area as a model. So let's just pretend this is the uh, Moscow uh, Pullman area. The first flow comes into about where I'm standing, maybe fills up the canyons. And then you eventually, the low, low flow, the uppermost flow would get to be about here somewhere. And you would start to have, what are you going to have? You're going to have deposition because you have increased the base level so much. The sediments being transported out of the mountain fronts into the bottom, into the flats, 
are going to start dropping those settings because you have plugged the accesses of those streams to the west. You have raised the base level. What you're going to get along the front are luvial fans. Now, this is not so very clear here, but here's a luvial fan that's changing in these sediments right across here. These are some debris flow sediments, uh, boulders, cobbles, sand. You walk the channels, you walk the trails up into the mountains. The trails are on the bottom of the dry stream channels, and they're all sand. They're all coarse sand, poorly sorted, angler, just like you get from the wells in the Moscow uh, area. So now I'm going to contend. And so what you have is lots of alluvial fans develop along the uh, uh, front of the uh, mountain range, primarily north of Moscow, heading up to what we might call Moscow Mountain area, uh, Steakhouse Hill area. In those areas, every time you change the, the water, the base level, raise the base level, you would be getting alluvial fans along the mountain front just like a delta going into a lake. Only in this case, there are alluvial fans at the surface. So debris flows that are in high water times will come down these canyons and come out what we call the chute. And it'll spread out in different directions all over the alluvial fan. Uh, just looking here, you can see what five or six major channels. Well, as that alluvial fan was built, uh, you would have hundreds of alluvial, uh, hundreds of channels in that fan, hundreds. Maybe they're small, but they crisscross each other and they interconnect. The, uh, in the Moscow pulmonary, this is a dry area, this is Death Valley. Uh, in the Moscow area, during the Miocene, it was very wet. So you had a lot of debris flows coming down, a lot of stream it's carrying a lot of material out of the mountains because the wet weather, uh, the sort of humid climate similar to North Carolina, high topography, uh, you'd have had a lot of loose material because the granite and uh, uh, weathers very easily in a wet climate. So you had a lot of coarse material in these channel areas being deposited by rapid decision, uh, deposition from the mountain fronts. How many times? Well, we think we have 25 flows that came over Pullman heading towards the mountain front. Well, right now we have four major canyons that must have existed somewhere back in the Miocene. They, the area is stable, except, except for erosion, but tectonic has been relatively stable. So the four mile area out of Viola, the Missouri Flat Creek, uh, area off of the Steakhouse Hill, Hill area, Paradise Creek, and the South Fork of the Palouse would have all had a fan complex somewhat like this developed with each, uh, with each e volcanic event that came into the Moscow Pullman area. Actually, some during the whole uh, emplacement of the Columbia River assaults. But you had to have at least, with each one of those events, you had to have at least four major fans. Uh, four times 25, there's a hundred fans, complexes were deposited and formed in the area between the uh, mountain front and the uh, easternmost extent of the basalt flows. So even though we have a lot of clay at the top of the, the last uh, fans, uh, there had to be these channels, and I will contend that the water gets down into those channels and gets down into our uh, aquifer system via alluvial fans. Now, let me move up to here. Oh, yeah, here we go. Now, what happens when it comes out the alluvial fan? Uh, if the alluvial fan does not quite build out to the end of the basalts, what you're going to have along the, the edge of the, the end of the alluvial fan, you're gonna have a lot of water getting concentrated into uh, uh, probably braided streams. The samples we have coming up from the wells are, are hard to work with because, uh, because of the drilling conditions, but they're certainly coarse grained, poorly sorted. Uh, you can develop a model that they were 
in a meandering stream system, or as I think most of them were braided stream system. It's where these braided stream systems existed between each flow, between the alluvial fans and the basalt front. It's where these streams existed in the subsurface of the major transport system for removing the water from the fans into the uh, braided streams and on into the basalts. Uh, in some cases, the alluvial fans went right up against the end of the basalt flows. Well, the water will be transferred <coughs> from the channels of the alluvial fans into the basalts. Uh, just backing up a little bit, some of you might remember the lecture on the origin of the basalts. Remember, we can make paleogeographic reconstructions for nearly every flow that came into the Pullman area. Give me a chance here to get a little drink of water. This particular setting, this paleogeographic construction, an instant replay in the emplacement of the basalt flows, shows the extent in green of the last Grand Ronde flow, the last of the rocks which contain lower aquifer water. And that's a, that line, of course, it's my little artistic uh, bending and thinking, but it's a lot of data for that. We have uh, over a hundred wells in this central part of the area that <clears throat> go through the upper aquifer and penetrate the top of the uh, Grand Ronde. So this ending is pretty well defined. And we also know at this time, this is at the end of the Grand Run. We also know at that time that there was a major little plateau out here uh, prohibiting or formed from the fact that there was not much, not any indication of many streams on the other side of that plateau. And when you get to Pullman, there's very little indication that any streams went west. Maybe down the folding of the anticline that it started here, the Pullman anticline. But it's very clear that that basalt blocked, at that point in time, blocked all the drainages going to the west. And in this case, uh, this particular case we have illustrated here, we also have good data on the sediments, fairly good data on the sediments. And they are braided streams that were flowing north into the uh, city of Palouse area through the Butte Gap. So here uh, th with this setting at that time, and now it's, that setting is buried. <coughs> and so you have water coming off of the basement rocks. The highs back then would have been this roughly correspond to the highs now. So water is coming down off of the highs, getting into the buried uh, paleo valleys or channels uh, in alluvial the alluvial fans are either building all the way out to the basalt, or the alluvial fans are have gravels and, and sands that transition into the braided stream system and causing water to move to the northwest. Far back, way back in the 60s, uh, Crosby did work in the sub uh, geophysics work uh, that shows uh, they interpreted that the channels coming out of Moscow uh, are going to the northwest. Presently, uh, Moscow number 10, one of the, the best, well, actually not one, it is the best well in the lower aquifer. It's located about the state line, and it is where the major concentration of channels occurred, not only during the upper aquifer, not only during this time, but previous, uh, previous area times when the basalt flows came close to Moscow. So this is where the water is getting transferred from the recharge areas to the west. Now back to that uh, recharge areas in Moscow. Some people I think will still have questions, how's that possible? Let's look at a couple of photographs. I'm gonna skip a couple of them and come down to one. Uh, this really explains or illustrates what I think George Grader was talking about. George Grader, Talk about this slope. The slope's going up to Moscow Mountain. Let's just pretend this is Moscow Mountain. This is another photograph down in Tucson. Let's suppose that's the Moscow Mountain area. Well, when we filled up the basin, the Moscow Pullman drainage system, 
uh, pre-paleo system, filled it up with sediments and basalts. This is 6,000 feet of relief here. Uh, the basalts would have come up about halfway. Sediments and basalts would have come up halfway. So what are we burying there? Well, we're burying old channels coming out of the mountain front, coarse grain sand. So I would contend that presently, if this was the Moscow area, covered with trees in the mountainous area, the slopes area being farmed, right here, there's still areas up towards the mountain front. And I must admit, I had earlier proposed re more recharge to the west towards uh, Pullman out of the alluvial fans into the Bessons, but I would say I should have been looking a little higher, as George Grayer would say, some of the paleo valleys in here. Here's some of the granite ridge, which would extend out into uh, what we would be buried. And this is we buried. So if you drill here at this location, you might quickly go into solid granitic rock and you would record it as granite. As I pointed out, this area in here, filled with the brief flow sediments, stream channel sediments, uh, and I didn't mention, but since you had breaks in deposition, you have some hard pan uh, uh, soil profiles and you drill through this area out here and the driller sees all this quartz and irregularly angular material, lots of muscovite, and he or she records, oh, we're in granite. So this is where we went wrong in the past, where I went wrong in the past. But the slope area is not just granite, it's also areas of thick sediment. So now we got the water coming out here and recharge and the diagram, a little bit different diagram. This is a, a swinging up towards Eiler's Gulch. And just one more kind of a illustration how water might be getting recharged. On the left is the Pullman test well. Uh, halfway between Moscow and, uh, and Pullman. And on the right, high elevation uh, well uh, drilled right next to the Idler's Gulch end of the road. It used to, here's this wide area of exposure of the Moscow mountain slopes. And in the subsurface, we know in yellow, we have lots of sediment places, not all granite highs, the sediments we just talked about. And there's channels. I probably put put more per, uh, orange on here. There are the channels. If you're going through a, eroded complexes of uh, uh, over uh, uh, 250 uh, uh, buried alluvial fan, braided stream complexes, you're going to hit channels. And that's when you hit the sand. In the subsurface, that's probably what you're hitting. There's also this, where's the debris flows? We really don't know how far down in the system they go. They are potential for near the mountain fronts to bring the water down along the granite fronts, down deep and along and getting water into the uh, lower aquifer shown here, aquifer basalt rocks shown here in red. And I would contend this is how the water is getting down here, two different ways. Some of it's coming down through just the channels, the stream channels, getting underneath the uh, basalt of Lolo, recharging our uh, upper aquifer in Moscow. I'd also contend that it comes down through debris flows. Don't know how far out into the system to go. Looking at a few chips coming up from a well, I just can't tell whether it's a uh, stream deposit, but uh, normal channel sedimentation or whether it's debris flows. But those debris flows probably extended out farther. But to me, the data shows, the information shows that we are in fact getting uh, recharge, modern recharge into that lower aquifer system, primarily down through these sediments. Other data that we have on the Basalto Lolo definitely makes it clear that we're not getting a lot of vertical uh, uh, recharge from the top because the, the basalt of low oil is such an aquitard uh, to, to vertical percolation. So this system is, this is how we are getting our recharge into our aquifers. Now I want to point out to you, sometimes I forget this. This is a sort of a, a southwest, northeast cross section. As we keep turning and looking at slices towards the Moscow mountain area, uh, Steakhouse Hill area, uh, 
there's another conclusion that the water isn't always just coming from the east. East of Moscow, actually, the hills aren't very high. You're probably not getting much recharge from there. The, as you approach the, to the northeast, you got to think about the water. It could be coming into Moscow from the Moscow mountain area into the cross section here. Now, for Pullman, it's going to go more west and head towards the Pullman area. This is where our number one recharge area is about. And I need to slow down a little bit because I get a little carried away about the uh, potential recharge and the fact we have recharged in the Moscow area. That is our number one source. High snowpack, high rainfall, high elevation, high water levels in the wells. That's where our recharge is coming from. But there are some other possibilities. We should just look at those uh, other potential areas, the uh, Pullman uh, area, the Palouse City area, uh, north, the southeastern margin of Moscow Pullman Basin, and maybe even the Genesee area. Getting back to our map, let's discuss Pullman. I talked about the uh, uh, Pearsall, Pearsall and uh, Sprinky uh, identifying this area as a recharge area. And it makes sense because the uh, particularly the south fork of the Palouse between Pullman and Albion is riding on top of the Grand Ronde and Moxley. 2011, master's thesis at Washington State University, building on some information from DOE studies. DOE studies show that there is water, or is the water from this stream is influxing, moving into the rocks. Moxley using uh, primary isotope data, very detailed <coughs> well descriptions uh, along the way, uh, proved pretty uh, substantially, substantial data documented, I should say, <coughs> excuse me a second, uh, documented that you have water moving across that channel, across that stream, uh, going into the contact on top of the Grand Ron, uh, into the Rosa, into the Vantage sediments. And he suggested that there is then possibly recharge getting down into the Grand Run since the water is, in the, is going into that contact. Later, uh, I transposed uh, my information that I retained from primarily from the uh, observation well, the more geology distinct data. I was able to realize that the seam is falling along the west limb of the Pullman Anticline. And those let limb, those rocks, slope out to the west. They drop about 200 feet in elevation over about four miles. And following the basic principles of groundwater movement, Moxley's were going back to even Barker back in 1979 suggested this area, this was the closest that the uh, aquifer rocks come to the surface. There's water recharging down the top, onto the top of the Grand Run, and therefore I, that's how part of the water, at least the maybe most of the water, is reaching out into the uh, Union Flat Creek area. So they recharge here in Pullman. Don't know how much, it's not quantified. We go up here to the Palouse City Basin, this area is primarily surrounded by quartzite ridges. I one time thought that there was a lot of recharge coming off of these quartzites. Uh, one study suggested that there's not much recharge because they uh, encountered mud, sediments, clay in uh, between the contact of the quartzites and the basalts. Uh, I've also later realized that, uh, of course, these elevations are lower than Moscow Mountain, so we don't have the snowpack, we don't have the rainfall. But more thinking about the rocks, I generally like to think about the rocks. The quartzite are very resistant. They don't weather as much as the granites. They don't make uh, a lot of clay and coarse grain sediments. From what data we have, the sediments and the vanities throughout the Palouse area, the sands are pretty well clean. That's because they're coming off of quartzite areas. So now I think they are recharge areas all the way down here to Albion. However, the lack of uh, sediments in alluvial fans next to the quartzite, because they don't produce a lot of sediments, I think it was Steve Robuchon who asked me the question about 
about quartzites and uh, recharge. And I should have realized before, but I realize now that quartzite highs are not significantly areas of recharge, but they do provide some recharge. And we know that the Palu City area is connected to the central part of the Palu Space and Aquifer System uh, through at least 600 feet of basalt uh, between the two and from water data. But maybe the Palu River itself up here is recharging. But in any case, this area has some potential for additional recharge, maybe not as much off as, as Moscow Mountain, but potential recharge. We run down here to the slide on down here to the edge of the Snake River. We know that the water and the lower aquifer system is not going out into the slopes and down into the Snake River. Uh, I think Bark presented information in the past that there's water sloping. Water level data showed that there is some recharge getting into the Union Flat Creek, potential recharge. There's also new data that may suggest that we drew our boundaries a little wrong, that there may be a little bit of recharge coming uh, down from uh, the Genesee area. These areas are low elevation, uh, not much precipitation, uh, somewhat drained by farming practices in which there are ditches uh, placed in to drain the water off the fields. And so it gets into the uh, stream and exits the area pretty fast. So they are potentials for additional recharge, not nearly as much as Moscow Mountain. And then we have the Southwest area. We can easily see as we drive towards Pullman from Moscow, look up in this area to the South is granitic rocks protruding above the basalt plains. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of data along the front of that rank, it should be recharging and probably is, but the mountains are a lot less higher than Moscow Mount area. Uh, so less snowpack, uh, less rain. So if there is recharge coming along those, and I believe there is, that's just some additional recharge to, to the subsurface, uh, but not near as much as Moscow. So. I'm running out of time. We need to come down to the conclusions. Um, we should have made these points. Recharge is significant, not insignificant. Modern recharge is occurring. Moscow Mountain area is the most significant area of recharge. And there are several areas of other possible modern recharge. You know, in summary, it's an active system. It's not a dead system of where all the water runs off in the streams, all the water is drawn up from farming. It's an active recharging system, not a dead system. Uh, and it doesn't mean that we don't have water problems. It means that we uh, need to incorporate in our thinking and our modeling uh, about this significant recharge. And I think we're getting close to actually understanding how much recharge we have. So. Uh, Thank you for listening to this talk. The next talk is, next two talks, one's on the, uh, how the upper aquifer responds. And the second lecture after that is uh, on the uh, conceptual model, how the lower aquifer uh, operates. Thank you for listening today.